you want. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm going to just start by introducing myself and then we'll introduce our guest. Uh, my name is Serby. I'm a first year medical student. Um, I, Alice, and Avni are all on the board of um, Emory's HSTAT chapter, which is health students taking action together. Um, one of the themes that we want to explore as a chapter this year is physicians as policymakers. So we're really excited to host um, our first event of the year. Um, with Dr. Michelle Au, who um, is a physician who recently won um, her seat for Georgia State Senate. Um, I'll let her introduce herself in a minute, but before I do, I just wanted to give you the agenda for today. I'll be moderating a discussion for about 30, 35 minutes. Um, if you have questions during that time, you can um, feel free to put them in the chat or directly message them to Avni. Um, after I'm done, John Mizuki, who's here from APAMSA, will ask a few questions and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So if you still have questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself at that time and just ask Dr. Ao directly. Um, so to begin, I, I know some people trickled in a little late, but you saw the comic that was up there. Um, before Dr. Ao ran for office, she also was well known for her comics, the Scott Monkey comics, you might've seen them. Um, Dr. Ao, if you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background and then potentially like talk a little bit about those comics as well. Sure, so hi everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy evenings. I know med students are very busy. I remember that well. So I appreciate you taking the time out to spend time with me and to hear uh, us chat about the importance of physician advocacy, because that's really one of the reasons that I took this new step in my, you know, I guess, expanding career. So I'm Dr. Michelle Au. I'm an anesthesiologist. I work at Emory St. Joseph's Hospital, which is right at the perimeter on Pill Hill, as they call it, right near Northside Hospital, where all the L&D takes place and next to Scottish Rite. Um, I have not been a med student for some time, but I went to medical school at uh, Columbia in New York. I graduated in 2003. I also did my residency at Columbia, actually did two residencies. I started in a peds residency and then I switched to anesthesia after my second year. Um, and uh, we moved to Georgia in about 2008 because my husband started his oculoplastics fellowship at Emory, uh, a lot of Emory in our life. Uh, oculoplastics, don't feel bad if you don't know what that is because I didn't know what it was and my spouse was doing it. <laughs> but it's a, it's a subspecialty of ophthalmology that's like a plastic surgery, reconstructive soft tissue of about like here on up. So everything excluding the eyeball itself. So like orbit, soft tissue, brow, tear, you know, tear ducts, all that, all that good stuff. Um, I've been working at Emory St. Joseph's Hospital for the past 12 years and i um, really love the practice of anesthesia, but at some point I uh, wanted to expand my usefulness a little bit more. And I, I think we'll probably get into that in a little bit. My life has been very interesting in that it's not totally linear. In addition to medicine, which is, you know, sort of like the standard path that a lot of people take. I've done a couple of other things that are a little more creative. Uh, the first thing that I did was this Scott Monkey comic strip, which I think you guys have seen. I started doing that my third year of medical school. So that would be like about 2003. I think like around the end of my third year of medical school, uh, my rotations were slowing down a little bit. I was looking to start my fourth year, which is, you know, kind of like a lighter year, especially after the first couple of rotations. I was like, what can I do? You know, med school is so um, inherently ridiculous. <laughs> and as you're living through it, you realize like, you know, it's very serious when you're doing it, but there's also this element of um, absurdity that, that you notice <laughs> as you're moving through the process. So I just kind of wanted to, um, chronicle that in a way that seemed creative and a little bit fun. And it was really just for my friends. I put them online, people seem to like them. And now, you know, they've been distributed very widely and internationally. Um, I got started with comic strips because when I was in college, I went to Wellesley College. Um, I was the school cartoonist for the school paper for the last three years of my college career. So that's kind of how I got started. So it really was just like a revisiting of um, that kind of work that I'd been doing, except extended to medical school. I also uh, ended up writing a book which came out in 2011, I actually got the book contract my third year of residency because I had kept a, a blog online since my first year of medical school. So you can imagine back then, it was a long time ago, this was before Google even was a thing. People didn't Google things. That was not a, a verb at the time. This was back when Amazon only sold books. So this was like very like web 1.0. So I kept what was called an online journal at the time, online because I wanted to keep my friends up to date with how medical school was and what I was doing. And I kept it for many, many, many years. At this point, the blog is more than 20 years old. 
but at some point a book agent uh, read the blog and said, you should, you should write a book. And I was like, okay, if you help me write the, you know, if you help me shop the proposal around, I'll do it. So that's how that came into being. So just being open to these sort of possibilities of having extensions of your medical life, but also incorporate creativity into it is how I got into some of these other paths. So the memoir that I wrote is about um, medical training. It's about med school and residency and about uh, incorporating family life and parenthood into it because I had my first kid my third week of anesthesia residency. So if you can't imagine that, that's pretty good because I would not recommend that as a plan. <laughs> it's not, not advisable, but it's what I did and it's a very good learning experience. And I think it's something that we probably could use more talking about is how to blend a very high power medical life and training and all these things that we're called on to do with the rest of your life, because that's important too, right? And that's how we ward off burnout is to have a full and active life both in and out of the hospital. So that's a very circuitous introduction to me and what I've done. <laughs> and the reason it's circuitous is because it's been in a lot of different directions, right? But, um, but we can talk a little bit more about the political part of the career now, because that's sort of the newest, the newest thing I'm doing. Yeah, that, I mean, we're really excited to hear about all of the other initiatives that you've done, but we, we wanna hear a little bit more about what inspired you to run for office. Why did you decide to enter public life? Absolutely. So that is the most common question I get asked at work, like at the hospital, like in the lounge, in the locker room. People ask, why, what, what made you wanna do this? Why are you doing this? You know, Sometimes in disbelief, because a lot of people are a little bit aghast about uh, translating medicine into politics, right? And I think the implication of that question why that I get asked by my colleagues at work a lot is um, basically they're asking like, why, why is this work important to you? Uh, why is this worth your extra time and effort outside of the hospital, despite all the good work that we're doing here, right? Why, why isn't being a doctor enough? I think that's what that question boils down to because you know our, our lives are very uh, fulfilling as they are and we're, we're doing good work uh, with patients. So the answer is this. Pretty early on in most people's medical careers, and you may have gotten there already, and certainly you will get there by the time you start your clinical uh, rotations. Um, pretty early in our medical careers, we come to realize that by the time our patients get to us in the hospital or in the clinic, and that's if, if they can get to us at all, it's really too late to treat a lot of the problems that made them sick in the first place, right? And so while we can do surgery in the OR or we can prescribe medications or we can recommend therapies or do all sorts of things, a lot of the factors that make our patients and communities unhealthy are really outside our ability to treat at the bedside. So all the training we've done in med school can't fix those problems, right? Um, in 2006, after that election, I think I had been thinking about these issues. And after the election result in 2016, sorry, not 2006, 2016, I realized that um, no matter how good the work we were doing at the hospital was, it clearly wasn't enough, right? And I realized I wanted to do more to affect change in community health at a wider level. So what I decided to do at that time and what seemed like a natural transition was to go back to school and to get my master's in public health. Because I figured if I had this training and I had this extra um, information that I'd be able to more um, usefully apply the medical training in a way that was more policy-based, right? So obviously when you get a master's in public health, you start to learn a lot about these things called the social determinants of health. And I think we'll probably get into talking about that in a little bit. And these are broader issues that determine the health of a community at large, including healthcare and insurance access, things like education and economic opportunity. You know, these are not things we think of classically as medical factors, but they definitely affect the health of a community much more than anything we do at the bedside. Uh, things like systemic racial inequity, public safety, all these things really make a huge difference in our patients' lives, and they're not things that um, we're trained to address as physicians. So once I did all this training and I wanted to figure out how best to apply this knowledge, I realized that the best way to enact change and enact the change that I wanted to see was actually to get involved at the legislative level. So you talked a little bit about how a political lens impacted your role as a physician. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel like a physician's voice is important in politics? Oh, oh sorry. My kid wants me to buy him a specific app. I'm like. Not now, I told them I was in a Zoom. Well, that's a great question, right? And I think I, I tend to think of things always through a medical lens, right? Because that's how I was trained. You know, I've been a doctor now for like almost 20 years. Um, so I always think of things as like in the setting of a hospital, right? So obviously when we're in a hospital, um, 
Well, let me start with the first thing, the public health thing. The great thing about having a public health degree is that it makes you realize there are actually very few policy issues that we deal with in the political sphere that don't somehow relate to community health. So in essence, everything we deal with in legislature is a social determinant of health, like all those things that I mentioned, not just the healthcare and insurance access, but education, economic opportunity, public safety, social equity, all these things relate to public health. Um, when we um, are in a hospital, obviously, we have a lot of uh, specialists, right? And the reason we have specialists is because um, different people have different experiences, different lived experiences, different academic experiences in different fields. And that's very important to inform giving people the best care, right? We want experts to be involved at every level uh, to flesh out the policy that we're trying to make. Um, I think having expertise in healthcare is a key piece of experiential um, value that physicians can bring to the table, right? I say this because there's been polling done before this past election that showed that 80% of Georgians felt that uh, healthcare specifically was a key issue in, in deciding their vote and they felt it was a key issue in um, determining what they felt was um, important in government, right? So imagine having so many people feel that healthcare is a crucial issue in their lives, but not having people who actually work in healthcare at the legislature, helping to shape these issues and helping to inform um, these decisions. I think that probably there aren't as many healthcare workers in the legislature as there need to be given how wide a scope of reach healthcare issues have in the legislature. So I think that just being that expert at the table and um, donating that time and service is an important piece of why I think it's important to have physicians and medical workers in general uh, at the legislative level. So when you talk about expertise, like bringing your medical expertise to politics, in 2018, we saw what they called a STEM wave. There were a record number of um, people with science and medical backgrounds running for office. Um, how do you think we can continue that momentum and to continue to engage people with science and medical backgrounds in the political sphere? You know, I think this is a great moment to have that conversation because I think that, um, you know, no one wishes that we were in a pandemic, but the fact of us being in this moment where people are speaking the language of science and speaking the language of public health and interested in these issues is sort of a galvanizing moment for people. It's also a galvanizing moment, I think, because a lot of people, myself included, feel that um, certain leaders and certain parties have taken science and public health and politicized them in a way um, to serve their own message and needs. And I think that scientists particularly object to that use of science because science inherently is not political. Science is um, about questioning and finding the closest thing to the truth as possible, right? So I think a lot of scientists um, are allergic to that type of messaging and it's um, offended us in a way that has spurred us to get more involved. If you look at this past legislative, or sorry, this past election cycle, there actually have been a large number of medical and science people um, getting involved in running for office and being elected specifically because of this issue of feeling that there is not enough scientific expertise representing us um, in our state and national legislatures. And especially in a moment where scientific literacy and public health literacy is so important that we feel that it's our, our duty and responsibility to share our knowledge and expertise in this way. So I think continuing to speak about these issues and having um, leaders who model this type of public service coming from outside other fields, not just lawyers, but scientists, doctors, nurses, all these kinds of people, is a way to keep this momentum going because you really need to show people that this path exists and show people why it's important. So having these types of conversations with you guys is important because you guys are the next are the next generation of leaders. And I don't, I don't doubt that there's gonna be some of people among you who are also gonna be running for office in the future too. So just starting that conversation early because no one had that conversation with me when I was in med school. It was not, it was not a thing to encourage doctors to run for office. Well, like related to running for office and serving in office, something you mentioned on the campaign trail was the benefit of a part-time legislature um, and how you feel that it's kind of spurs civic engagement, encourages civic engagement. Can you talk a little bit more about the benefits of having a part-time legislature, why it has kind of helped you decide to run and how you're balancing your career as a physician with your career as a legislator? Right. 
That's a great question because people, that's like the second most common question that people ask me. They ask me, are you going to quit your job now? Are you not going to be at the hospital anymore now that you've been elected? So every state legislature is different. How Georgia's works is it is a part-time legislature and how it's written to the constitution is that the Georgia General Assembly meets for 40 working days a year. So 40 days in session at the Capitol. So usually those days are spread out over, uh, you know, beginning of January through the end of March slash beginning of April. They don't meet every consecutive day, but, um, you know, most days in between. So I think this is good for a couple of reasons. One is that um, having a citizen legislature and one that is part time enables people to continue to be part of their communities and societies in a more meaningful way. Right. We're not at the Capitol full time. We're not uh, career politicians, right? So it allows us, I think, to keep a foot in the real world and to keep informed with the issues and the concerns that drew us, hopefully, to the legislature in the first place, right? So for me, um, I will be taking a leave of absence from the hospital just between January and March, just because it is difficult to work at the hospital when you actually are at the Capitol every day. I don't have like billable hours or I can't do things at weird times like a, like a real estate agent or a lawyer might be able to do. And I wanna obviously respect my partners because we have a call schedule that they make in advance. So I really can't like put people in a position where I'm there one day and gone the next, right? But the rest of the year, I wanna continue working because what animates me and what brought me to the legislature are these issues of patient needs and patient stories and seeing the ways that our system works and the ways that our system doesn't work, more importantly. So I think it's very satisfying for me to be able to do this legislative work, but also keep a foot in uh, the field that brought me there in the first place. And hopefully maybe over time, see the kind of changes that we're working on playing out in real patients' lives. That's, that's, what, that's my hope. So I, I want to pivot a little bit and talk about some of these issues that you care about, what inspired you to run for office. So your campaign really centered on access to care and health care in Georgia. Um, what are your legislative priorities? What actions will you take to achieve these goals that you have when you enter office? Right. So one of my main platform planks has been um, centered around sort of protecting and strengthening the Affordable Care Act, which is clearly a national issue, but I'm gonna talk about the ways that it relates to being a state issue, okay? So one of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act is it gave states the option of fully expanding Medicaid, okay? Fully expanding Medicaid, meaning, um, you know, Medicare is um, federally sort of enforced, whereas Medicaid is state by state. That's why every state has different Medicaid requirements and why it's so different um, in different states, what kind of benefits that people get. Georgia is one of the few states, one of the only 12 states in the nation that has still refused to expand Medicaid. Expanding Medicaid would further a lot of the goals that I hold to be important. It would cover um, about 500,000 more people that are currently uninsured in Georgia. It would expand funding for our beleaguered uh, rural healthcare systems, which are in crisis and freefall. I'm sure you guys have read that in the news that rural hospitals are closing. They can't stay open. They're, uh, they don't have enough staff. They don't have enough equipment. They don't have enough cash flow to stay open. Um, it would help fund a lot of our public health offices and safety net services, like for mental health, that um, have had their budgets slashed in recent years and have had their budgets drastically slashed this year when we had a huge revenue shortfall because of COVID. And it would further a lot of the goals that, um, that I can talk about a little bit later on. Um, you know, refusing to expand Medicaid, it, it doesn't make any sense uh, logically or fiscally, especially during a pandemic where state revenues are low. And just from uh, a, you know, an ethical standpoint, it really doesn't make sense morally to stand in the way of receiving the help that we have already been allocated just on a purely ideological standpoint, right? The money that funds full Medicaid expansion to cover these hundreds of thousands of more people is actually federal tax dollars that we as Georgians have already paid to the federal government. And it's been earmarked to come back to us to pay for our own healthcare and our own citizens. And we're refusing this money, right? So this money is going somewhere else now because we have determined that we don't want it because we don't want to you know, support Obamacare. I think this is a problem and I think that um, you know, people have argued that because we do have a Republican um, majority, we have a Republican governor, a Republican majority in um, both the House and the Senate, that it makes it difficult to uh, move the needle on this issue because it does tend to be an ideological issue. 
However, now that we have a new administration um, with the Biden administration coming in and with the COVID pandemic continuing, I'm hoping that one of the issues we can revisit or at least keep on pushing forward is at least the fiscal responsibility of accepting this federal money that belongs to us to come back to our own state in a time of crisis, right? So that's something I'd really like to work on. One of the other things that relates to this is to try to improve uh, Georgia's maternal mortality crisis. You guys are probably aware that Georgia ranks uh, near the bottom nationally in terms of our maternal mortality. And if you look at the racial breakdown of how maternal mortality plays out, it's even worse for black women in the state of Georgia uh, versus white women nationally, how bad our maternal mortality figures are. This is a problem we're aware of that they've addressed in the state legislature because, you know, this is a bipartisan issue, right? No one Republican or Democrat can look at, say that, oh, we have the worst maternal mortality in the nation. I'm okay with that. No one says that, right? So they, they have determined to work on it. They've worked to expand Medicaid coverage for postpartum mothers from up from uh, eight weeks postpartum up to six months, which is good. That's a good start. That's what they've said as of the last session. However, they did not allocate any money for it. Right. So it really doesn't mean anything if you just say, oh, we're going to we're going to have this program, but not invest or put resources behind it. That that's a meaningless gesture. So I would like to work on securing the funding to actually do what we said would be best. And part of that is also being open to accept the federal aid that is due to us to expand our health care coverage. So those are two two big issues for me that I'd like to work on. And I'd like to actually hear from you guys what you think is important now that you've been in med school for a little bit. Well, I, just to start with Medicaid expansion, um, now you mentioned the Affordable Care Act has been law for almost a decade, um, but we still haven't seen Medicaid expansion here. Um, mm -hmm. How do you foresee like COVID-19 might have changed the political landscape such that we can actually move towards Medicaid expansion? Or do you feel like the, there are still those same political barriers up here in the state? Right. You know, that's a tough question because I don't feel like the political barriers were entirely based in logic or fiscal responsibility. You know, when I spoke with uh, Republicans and I work with a lot of Republicans, I have no, I'm not like a super, like, I have no animus towards Republicans. We work with all different types of people in medicine, right? So we, we work on consensus building. Many of the arguments that uh, my Republican colleagues had given for um, the reasoning behind not expanding Medicaid is that they felt that in accepting this money, that it uh, was a costly expansion, it was a costly program that was not sustainable. Um, that they worried, oh, you know, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but Medicaid expansion to cover these more people, it's subsidized 90% by the federal tax dollars we've already paid and only 10% by the state. So actually this proposal costs the state less money because we only have to fund 10% of it than what um, the governor has proposed, which is a Medicaid waiver plan, which covers far fewer people, costs the state more money. It doesn't make any sense just from a dollars and cents point of view. Um, you know, and Republicans say, oh, what if we agree to this, but then down the line, uh, the federal government changes its mind and doesn't decide to fund 90% anymore. And then we're on the hook for this money, right? So I have two answers to that. One is that, as you noted, the ACA has been on the books for 10 years now. It's been going strong. It's a very popular program. There's a commitment from this upcoming administration um, to this program. And also um, there's a commitment from the public that this program is good and people have been helped by it. So there's no indication that they're going to pull the money because it's actually been working, right? Because if they were, they would have pulled it a while ago. It's been 10 years now, right? And the second issue has more to do with ethics is that if someone is offering you this help in a time of extreme need, right? And I'm talking about, you know, during this pandemic, we covered, we cut billions of dollars from our state budget, including from things that we really need, like our public health systems, rural health care programs, um, mental health, all these things um, that are... Uh, similarly or mirroring the crisis in COVID, we're cutting all this money. Someone's offering us help and ways to help real people right now get more care. Is it moral to refuse it because of some imagined future where but maybe in 10 years they, we, they won't give us the money anymore? You know, <laughs> to refuse the money on a theoretical basis that could help us now is I think immoral, right? And to frame it as an ideological issue is uh, taking the abstract as an excuse for real good that you could be doing right now. 
So that's sort of my reason. Um, that would be my reason in speaking with our Republican colleagues on why this makes fiscal sense in the moment is you have to frame it in the sense that real people are suffering and it's immoral to turn away the help that we could be giving them. So I think, I mean, a lot of students may be on this call, but in general, might be looking at the healthcare conversation and feeling a little bit lost. It feels like the business side of healthcare is kind of the center of consciousness these days. Um, how do you feel like medical schools can evolve to help equip us as future physicians with the understanding and the skills necessary to be able to tackle these kinds of problems and really understand them? You know, one thing, I've thought about this a lot because when I went back to get my public health degree, and this was many years, it was probably more than a decade after I had graduated from medical school. And when you get your public health degree, especially the first uh, year, you learn a lot of these basic things, such as healthcare policy, the history of Medicare and Medicaid, how it works, how it came about, how it's changed. Um, real basic things like healthcare economics. Like I'd never even taken an econ class in college, right? Because I was like, a different major. I, I didn't think it was important. So this was my first time learning about a lot of these things. There was uh, healthcare law, um, uh, hospital management and strategy, all these things that, um, especially since I had been practicing in medicine for a while and coming back to get my public health degree, I realized I wish I had learned this years ago. Like this would have been so helpful to know that there are all these details and all these things that push and guide uh, the decisions we make in the healthcare system and at the hospital and in our clinics um, that were not obvious to me before because I'd never learned about them. I'd never seen them. So what I would love, I think, to speak to your point, is if there was a way that medical schools could more easily incorporate some of these elements of a public health um, curriculum into the standard med school curriculum, right? And not even necessarily as a separate class, because I think sometimes when you put it as a separate class, it's segmented in a way that's not organic because these issues really play into all fields of medicine and everything we do, right? Like healthcare economics guides everything we do. Um, things like uh, learning about racial health disparities and social equity, these guide a lot of the decisions that we make, right? So to put it as a separate class doesn't do justice to those issues. I feel like they should be taught alongside our standard curriculum. I understand the challenges of this because, you know, having been a med student, I know it's only four years long and they barely can fit in the stuff that we have to learn now, right? And, uh, you know, every year, every decade, there's like so much more to learn in medicine that they actually have to decide like what, what to cut out from the curriculum so it can all fit. So I understand that it's challenging, but I also think that when we are in a place where we realize how important these issues are, that we have to prioritize and uh, sort of budget towards um, the important things. And we can't really teach the next generation of um, physician leaders to be more legislatively active unless we teach it as sort of a standard part of a medical curriculum. So that's sort of my, you know, maybe facile philosophy of how to get more people interested. But, um, you know, people aren't going to, you know, you guys are so tired, you're not going to like pick up an extra book at the end of the day and read about healthcare economics, right? Like it would be nice if it was just part of normal life that you were learning. So you, I mean, you hinted about this when talking about your public health degree, but healthcare is so much more than just insurance coverage or biology or one aspect of healthcare. Um, and, you know, recently DeKalb County declared racism as an epidemic, framing it as a public health issue. And you hinted at, you know, this when you were talking about your legislative priorities, but um, what policies do we need in Georgia to start addressing this issue? Um, and how can we as students try to frame the way that we're learning about medicine so that we can, you know, better understand health equity issues like right from the beginning? Yeah, this is a very complicated issue and you have to like, you know, I'll try to do it justice, but obviously there are people who spend their entire lives and their entire careers studying and speaking and teaching about the issue of uh, racial health equity, right? So it's hard to talk about it in a short encapsulated way, but I would say that um, there's probably two sort of thematic approaches of how we can approach this issue. We can approach it from uh, within the field of medicine and also from the outside, right? So in terms of from the outside, we've alluded to some of this, that some of the issues with racial health equity have to do with um, really every step in the healthcare process as people try to access it, right? Because what we see is that communities of color 
and people who uh, are socioeconomically disadvantaged have difficulty accessing healthcare every step of the way. They have different difficulty um, getting insurance, accessing healthcare. They have difficulty with, um, you know, chronic health issues. They have uh, difficulty with how they interface with the health system. Um, they tend to have worse outcomes and it affects the way those outcomes are interpreted by the institution, right? So every step of those ways, uh, every step of the way in, in that sort of outside standpoint needs to be addressed, um, I think, in a concerted policy way, not just um, noticing that there are uh, healthcare disparities, but actually having like very targeted systematic ways to address these uh, inequalities in access. And the second way that's almost a little bit less popular to talk about, and again, this is a much bigger issue than we can address in you know two or three minutes, is that there is a uh, institutional racism that permeates the medical system. It affects the way that we're taught in medical school, and it affects the way that we don't address the historical racism that permeates you know, our curriculum and the way that we are taught to approach patients, right? And I'll just give one sort of example that is, uh, you know, probably easy to see is that when we learn about dermatology or dermatopathology, that a lot of the historical slides that were shown about skin conditions are shown in uh, white skin, right? So all the ways that we diagnose patients are presented in ways that are inherently um, biased towards making easier or more precise diagnoses in white patients, right? Um, you know, to really fully address the ways that uh, systemic racial inequities permeate the medical curriculum is going to take, again, a real expansion of how we teach medicine. And it can't be a separate class. There can't be a class that's just like, oh, this is the week that we learn about systemic racism and you do the, you know, the puff soft class and then it's over and you take your little exam and it's done. It has to be part of every single class that we learn about and we incorporate it into our curriculum in a way that um, we start right from the beginning, from the second we start med school and realizing that this is an issue and every step of the way, how to be specifically and explicitly anti-racist and how we approach our patients and to um, try to make up for that gap in where our healthcare disparities uh, you know, fall short. Um, well, thank you for addressing that quickly. Um, I know I, if anyone has any other questions, you can put them in the chat. And we can you know, come back to this in the Q&A. Um, the pandemic has really highlighted a lot of the racial disparities that are already present in our community. Um, how has the pandemic changed the way that you view your role as a physician policymaker? And um, what do you perceive the barriers have been for the healthcare ecosystem to really um, like command a robust response to the state's embrace of you know, inhumane policies during COVID-19? That's a really good question and it's very broad. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna frame this in the setting of a vaccine rollout because I think that makes it more targeted and I think it touches on a lot of the issues that you wanna talk about. So, uh, you know, when we talk about vaccine rollout and we, um, you know, obviously we're all very excited that Pfizer and Moderna have submitted to the FDA and they're going through the approval process and we're already talking about who's gonna be the high priority groups that get um, vaccinated first, right? So I think the CDC has put out that the first priority group is gonna be, you know, more high risk people. So they, I think they've narrowed it down for the first wave to long-term care facility residents because they obviously are the highest risk population, highest fatality rates and the way they live makes the disease very easy to spread. And you know, the second round would be like healthcare workers working again in high risk environments, but more crucial than that, that healthcare workers like you, like me, are essential to delivery of medical care for the rest of the population during the pandemic, right? Then we go down the list and talk about, well, you know, how, how do we uh, further triage these high-risk populations? What I, what I think I would like to see discussed more at the government level and at the state legislative level, which is where these decisions are going to get made, are specific targeted strategies um, to ensure that communities of color receive equitable access to these vaccines, right? Because these inequities that we've been talking about in the healthcare system are mirrored if not magnified in how the COVID pandemic, as you mentioned, has played out nationally, right? Because black, Latinx, indigenous communities are three times more likely than white communities to suffer the consequences of this epidemic. And we see this every day at the hospital. 
And we know that these same communities also have a more difficult time accessing things like preventative care, testing, treatment, every step along the way, it's more difficult, right? And that's why people have worse outcomes. There's, there's a thought that, um, you know, simply making the vaccine free and making it available at every CVS and Walgreens and, you know, Target, every neighborhood drugstore change is the answer to getting the vaccine to everyone, right? But that's not the case, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't see these disparities because these methods exist already, right? Equal availability does not translate into health equity. And not addressing these specific issues threatens to widen this gap of health and economic disparities even more so than we've already seen, right? So we really have to be smart and focused in how we roll out these vaccines to address this issue in specific. Because you know, vaccines themselves don't prevent disease, right? Making a vaccine doesn't cure the pandemic. It's vaccine delivery programs and strategies that prevent the disease. And that's what we want, right? So in order to address the racial equity issue in vaccine delivery in specific, I think what we need to do is the following. And we can generalize this to other problems too, but just specific to the COVID vaccine. The first thing we need to do is to rebuild trust with our communities, right? Not only has trust been corroded in recent months because you know of communication with the administration and also not just that, and I'm not just saying the current administration has problems communicating, which they do, but I'm also talking about decades and centuries of historical mistreatment of communities of color by governments and healthcare organizations, right? And especially, you know, we live in the South now. So, you know, the specter of the Tuskegee syphilis um, experiments and all these sorts of things casts a long shadow in our communities. And I don't blame people for not necessarily trusting the healthcare community to take care of them and to not trust the narrative that a you know quickly developed vaccine that people view as experimental is being pushed on, you know, communities of color. I, I don't blame people for being a little bit leery of that, right? So we really need to reach out to communities of color for dialogue about vaccine efforts and make sure that communities of color are really included in these conversations. And importantly, to be transparent about the results of the research that we're putting out and the safety of these vaccines so that people feel confident in taking them. Second thing we need to do is invest resources. Like I say, if something's important, you need to put money behind it to make sure that these vaccine delivery systems are effective and far reaching, particularly in communities of color. So not just giving it to every CVS and Walgreens, but funding state and city public health departments, local primary health clinics, which is where people are gonna be accessing these vaccines and employing the help of community health workers to go out into the community and reach people because maybe that's the way to get to them, not to get them to come to us, but to, but to get out to them. Um, the third thing is to really have a good preemptive public health communication uh, strategy to frame expectations, right? As we know, both Moderna and Pfizer at this point have designed their vaccine to be delivered in two split um, doses, right? Like three or four weeks apart for each of them. So in order to make sure that people not only get the first vaccine, but also come back for the second one is gonna be a really key logistical challenge, especially if people are already a little bit hesitant about getting vaccines, a little bit nervous, they get the vaccine and they have a maybe sort of standardish vaccine reaction fever, headache, chills, you know, that really mirrors a lot of the symptoms of COVID that people have been looking for this whole time. You, you don't blame people if they don't know that that's what they expect to be scared off and to not come back. So preemptively communicating, here's what you should expect. This is normal, this is okay. It's, you may have a little bit of discomfort, but it's important to come back because it's better still than getting the disease. That's important work you should be doing right now before the vaccine comes out, before we can expect people to accept it. So those, that's just a start. Um, but that's, you know, what I've been thinking of a lot. Well, I mean, related to the work that needs to be done, what can we as students really do in this moment to advocate best for our patients and, you know, to help out with a lot of these initiatives that you just mentioned? I think one important thing in the communication phase is to really start reaching out to patients and not just telling them things, which is what doctors are really unfortunately good at. It's just like lecturing them and telling them, here's what, you, here's what you should do. This is what I think, but listening to people, right? And I think that as when I was a medical student, that was sort of the luxury that I had because I, even if I was busy, I didn't have a patient list the way that my residents did and certainly not like my attendings did. I had time to sit with patients, really spend time with them, get to know them, talk to them. And what I would do if I was a med student is if there were people who are in at risk communities or populations who are hesitant maybe about accepting the vaccine to ask them, you know, what are your concerns? What have you been hearing? Um, 
what do you think about uh, the fact that this vaccine was rolled out quickly? Does that worry you? What would make you feel better? Uh, what what information would you need or would your family or community want in order to feel confident about accepting this very important uh, preventative measure? I think that's a great way to do it when you uh, have the benefit of being close enough to talk to people and having an excuse to do it and also having the, the time to do that kind of thing. I think that would be a great piece. And as medical students, you are so informed and so plugged in to the medical system that you're able to give them a lot of these answers to help them feel better, right? So I think that's a great first step and something that's easy for you guys to do. Well, thank you so much for answering all of my questions. Um, now I'm just gonna call on people or read out questions from the chat. So I'll start with John Mizuki because uh, we're co-hosting this event with the PAMSA, um, which is the AAPI affinity group on campus. So I think he has a question for you. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Al. Thanks so much for coming to talk to us and thanks to HSAP for setting this up. Um, it really is their event. We'd really you know, do a whole lot. Um, um, but I was just wondering, you know, on when we talk about racial equity, a lot of it is spoken in terms of black and brown and white and not to mitigate the gravity of racial inequity in those communities. But I was wondering if you could speak a little about um, based on your experience and also on based on research that you've done, what are some health disparities and health equities that uh, specifically impacted Asian communities, um, and particularly here in Georgia as well, if you could. Yes, and I totally agree with you. You know, I, I know that that is sort of um, a la mode in this moment when we refer to communities of color to say our black and brown communities. And you'll notice I actually have not used that term because I feel maybe as you do, that that glosses over um, the fact that you know, maybe it's a shorthand and I understand it doesn't mean literally explicitly, you know, it doesn't explicitly mean skin color, but I think that speaking in a way kind of frames the way people think about issues. And I don't want to cut out people that people don't traditionally think of as having black or brown or white skin, right? I'm Asian, right? And I, I do feel that in political discourse in specific and also in uh, public health discourse, that people tend to oversimplify the diversity that we see in our communities and to cut people out and in some ways not speak to those communities uh, in this targeted way that we're trying to do in trying to help everyone that if we don't reach out to every part of the community that maybe some people are left out and uh, left behind. So, you know, Asian people also in this COVID pandemic have been disproportionately affected um, in terms of having uh, worse outcomes and higher mortality. The numbers sort of vary across the board because obviously we know that a socioeconomic status also has a huge bearing on people's healthcare uh, access and outcomes. And also this goes without saying, and for every uh, ethnic and racial group that uh, AAPI communities are not a monolith. There's a huge uh, difference in terms of different AAPI groups and where they come from and how they live and work and play and their approach to family and education, all these things are very different. So it really does a disservice to everyone to, to refer to them monolithically. However, I think that we are at a cultural moment now where we are becoming more aware of the level of diversity, not just nationally, but in Georgia in specific. And I don't know if you guys have seen this recently, and this was more related to the election itself, but people seem to have suddenly realized that a lot of Asian people live in Georgia. And I don't know if you've seen this like in the New York Times and the Washington Post, because the Asian electorate in specific really stepped up in this last election to, uh, to turn out and vote and really made up more than the margin of victory in this state. So it really kind of made people realize like, oh, this there's this whole, you know, under, uh, not to say underappreciated, but like under this unseen, you know, group of people that, that live here that really need to be taken into account when we have these political discussions. Um, I think that in terms of approaching healthcare disparities as they affect all groups, we need to broaden the way we talk about it. And I do agree with you, John, that um, breaking things down into simply black, white, Latinx oversimplifies it and it makes us not think along these other paths. So I think just having these discussions and including different types of people is, is important as part of our education. Um, so one of the questions we got in the chat is, so here in Georgia, we've had several recent examples of medical misinformation informing policy, like the recent heartbeat bill um, and abortion restrictions based on weeks since conception. Um, in an age where so many in power are becoming blatantly anti-science, how can we best combat this? 
Yeah, that's a that's a hard topic. And I will say that the heartbeat bill in specific was one of the early sort of like seeds that made me realize that I wanted to do more, right? Because when you hear these discussions taking place that are ostensibly based in science, but when you know you're actually trained in medicine and science, you realize they're completely not science-based at all. They're just presented in this like sort of pseudo-scientific way in a way that um, manipulates public thought and disseminates misinformation. It really makes you um, mad, right? Because I think it, um, it goes against a lot of our basic principles, even against the basic principles of uh, medical ethics that we practice and take very seriously in terms of presenting patients with factual information, presenting them with uh, the pros and cons on each side, and allowing them to make uh, informed, fully informed decisions and uh, consent with full information. So that, you know, offends me and I'm sure it offends all you guys to hear this anti-scientific information. In terms of people who really reject scientific thinking and sort of um, commit to an anti-scientific way of, you know, communication and living, it's difficult to convince people because it really comes down to uh, a matter of, you know, science versus faith in some ways that you can't convince people out of something that they believe because faith sometimes is uh, made on the basis of things for which you have no proof, but what you feel like it's difficult to, to talk people out of it. So I think the best way to do it is to step up and become a respected resource for your communities and for the people that you seek to represent. That um, once you have that type of training, you're going to medical school, you're gonna be a doctor, that people will come to you and ask you, what do you think about this? I read this in on Facebook, I, I heard this in the news. Is that real? Is that right? You know. And just sort of stepping up to a place where you're visible, that people will come to you for that information, or you know, maybe running for office yourself and being that countervailing force to, um, you know, you, you can't shut it down entirely, but you can at least make sure that the other point of view is vocal and plausible and uh, you know trustworthy, that people can make their own decisions based on what they hear and based on how you communicate it. Thank you. Um, so our next question, um, I think Faison, you can just unmute and ask. All right, thank you for this. Um, I had a, had a question around, you mentioned briefly kind of the experience from some of your colleagues. I'm, I'm curious from both your colleagues and voters, what was their experience? I, how was their reaction to you when, um, you know, you ran for office, you decided you were gonna run for office, was it, well received and voters like kind of like that you were a scientist, a doctor, or what, what was your kind of experience as you ran for office? Yeah, well, from the voter side, I think that especially because of when this um, campaign launched, it really was sort of at the end of last year, beginning of this year, that we were in this moment where, like I said before, people were paying more attention to science and medicine and public health. So I think people, uh, a lot of people liked the idea of having someone with medical training, with public health training, um, wanting to help inform the decisions that really affected them, affected all of us in our regular lives, given that it was such a huge part of our you know, current thinking now. And it affected everything that we were doing. It affected our kids going to school. It affected us going to work. All parts of our life suddenly boiled down to these public health type issues. So I think a lot of people did like that. On the other side, I want to give a rosy picture of it because some people, uh, did not like it. Like my opponent, I think, uh, explicitly had a couple of attack ads and, you know, uh, attempts on the fact that, you know, not everyone likes doctors, like I hate to tell you this, but there was some sense, and I'm sure I'll hear more of it, that, you know, doctors um, are representing special interests, that they are self-interested themselves in protecting um, their bottom line and billing and they just want to like protect their own uh, you know revenue sources you know like i'm sure you can make that argument for anyone in any type of specialty type field but i did hear some of that specifically from people who wanted people to not vote for me and i get it you know i mean that's i guess what you would do if you were running against someone that you would appeal to that uh sense of doctors being maybe 
elitist or out for themselves and you know that that sort of line like oh drive your lexus you know like I, I think people have negative conceptions of doctors too and we should not be ignorant to that fact that you know sometimes people think we just are like have our heads up our asses and we just want to go home and golf or something like that you know you you've heard those jokes too um or that we have bad handwriting which i don't i have good handwriting as you saw with my comic strip um so I think it's balancing those things. I think that in this moment, it was uh, helpful to be running as a doctor because I think that two things. One, we talked about the pandemic and how people are more inclined to want to listen to trusted medical sources now. But also, you know, um, politics is so politicized and people are really kind of sick of politicians because there's just so much garbage that we're hearing. People are disinclined to trust physician, uh, pol politicians more than ever now. However, people still trust doctors, right? No matter what people say, people still trust what doctors are saying. So that's helpful. And I think that we should be very uh, respectful and uh, of that trust that people give us unconditionally and use it as best we can to you know, judiciously guide uh, ways that we can help them and not waste that goodwill. Thank you. So we have a few more questions in the chat. Um, how do you balance staying up to date on both medicine and politics? How do you gain the experience to know how to approach legislation? Do you have advisors? I definitely have people who are helping me and we're actually building our team now. I'm gonna actually start uh, announcing our team for the legislative session. I have very excellent people who are working with me that are really gonna help me. Um, you know, We're gonna hit the ground running because I really wanted to get our team up and running so that we can um, sort of study what we wanna be doing and uh, get started without too much transition time. However, it is hard to keep up to date on everything. You know, I think the most challenging thing as you alluded to is just how much reading I need to do to make sure that I know what I'm doing and know what I wanna be doing. So, you know, the challenge of keeping up in medicine is a never ending struggle. And people who practice medicine will tell you that all the time. It's like, how do you keep up to date? You, you know, you don't like you have your pile of New England journals that grow and you're like, I'll read that later, you know, and oftentimes I end up doing my reading because I have a patient with something unusual or I'm just like, oh, I haven't seen that in a long time. And you read it specifically because it's incited by a specific clinical encounter you've had. And that's sort of the best way I've been able to do it because it, it you know, engages you in the moment and it keeps you up to date, even though it's a very scattershot way to do it. Uh, it's not the best way. If I was an academician, I'm sure I'd have more time to do that kind of stuff. But same thing with in um, within politics is uh, I am still in the rapid like acceleration phase of learning how to be a legislator. I haven't even been sworn in yet, right? So I'm really trying to, like I said, try to hit the ground running and you know read as much as I can and um, learning what's happened, especially in the past legis legislative session, what bills were passed specifically related to healthcare, what happened to them? Did they pass or did they not? Why didn't they pass? Are they going to come back? Are going to people going to reframe this bill and try to get it through in a different way? because I wanna be aware of my environment. I wanna be aware of what I'm working with and want to be aware of what to look out for and what I might wanna put forth myself as a bill as we move into the session. So it's really a lot of studying and reading and boring stuff that, you know, it would not be a good TV show because it would just be me sitting with a binder for many hours. <laughs> also keeping up to date on uh, current events, especially now how quickly the news cycle is moving, especially in Georgia. You know, you talk about like the center of the political world is right here right now. So keeping up to date with that is uh, challenging, but that's why uh, Twitter exists, I guess, to poke things in front of you to look at. Um, all right, so a couple more questions in the chat. Um, what are other paths to have a medical career interfacing with policy besides pursuing a position as an elected representative? I think there are a lot of ways to do it. And I think the easiest way I would do it for you guys, especially, because it's gonna be a path that's sort of like already carved out for you and they're going to love it if you do this is to try to get involved with um, your professional medical societies, especially as I'm sure in med school, they have clubs or groups that will help steer you towards like the legislative arm of like the AMA or whatever other groups, AMSA, those types of groups that do legislative work um, in Washington or in the state. And once you start to get into residency or um, pursue certain specialties that each specialty will have their own uh, state and national medical group. Like mine is the ASA, the American Society of Anesthesiologists and the GSA, the Georgia Society, which both have pretty robust uh, legislative arms that they use to uh, work on physician advocacy, patient advocacy, more related to the field of anesthesia, right? Um, 
in terms of state societies, um, MAG, if you guys haven't looked into that, they do have, I think, a couple of opportunities for students. That's the Medical Association of Georgia. And they also have a very robust um, legislative arm and they're at the Capitol actually quite frequently. So you should uh, look into that because that's an easy way to translate from what you're doing in the classroom to a legislative arm without having to commit too much time or like get too much into it. Like you don't have to commit your life to it. You can just like go to a meeting, listen in, see if you like it or not. And if you do, they have days at the Capitol, um, there's volunteer opportunities. And I actually personally, I should mention it, I guess to you guys, plan to when we get up and running to have um, days that people can come to our office, our legislative office at the Capitol and shadow us and see how bills are moving through and just, you know, do some work with us, you know, easy stuff. It's nothing you'd have to commit a lot of time to to see if you like it, you know? That kind of thing I think is low impact. And I specifically, because I am from this community and I am a doctor, I am interested in getting people involved who are particularly focused on healthcare policy and legislation. So I think that would be a good way if you guys want that you can email me and we could, we could get you in the office and see if you wanna hang out. Well, thank you for that. I think those all sound like really great opportunities. I know we're running really close to 8 p.m. Um, do you have time for a few more questions? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Um, so one more from the chat. So you mentioned that um, postpartum care had been extended in the Medicaid expansion discussion, um, but no budget amendments had been made for that. How often do these gestures or statements occur that aren't effectively um, backed? Well, this uh, they, they convened a panel to study this maternal mortality issue, I think about two years ago, because they realized this was a huge issue and everyone wanted to look at it. So they had this whole huge study program that they did and they looked at all the data and they presented it. But when this uh, proposal to expand Medicaid coverage for new moms specifically from eight weeks up to six months came forward, it was at the same time that we were making the budget for this next year, which included huge uh, budget cuts because of the COVID related revenue shortfall. I don't know about how often this happens, generally speaking, in terms of uh, measures that uh, you know get brought forth but aren't uh, don't have the full backing of money behind them. But um, definitely, this past session, this you know, this is something that happened quite a bit because of not having <laughs> the funding to put behind a lot of things and actually cutting almost one billion dollars from our public education budget. You know, we're cutting cutting our way out of this you know, recession, essentially. Um, I think it's a good start. You know, I mean, the fact that they did all the research, it did show that there is some commitment to it, but I don't want people to feel like just because they said, here's what we should do, that that's enough, because obviously nothing happened just by talking about it. Um, so that's something I'm gonna specifically follow up on next session. And, uh, you know, one way that we talked about, you know, I talked about like that we're just trying to cut our way out of our problems. There are sources of revenue we can bring in that can help shore up these um, things that uh, aren't fully funded. One thing that I think is interesting to you guys in specific and to public health people in specific is that Georgia has one of the lowest tobacco taxes in the nation. I think ours is something like it's like 31 cents per pack and the national average is like $1.81 per pack. So if we at least raise the tobacco tax in the state to the national average, that would generate about $650 million in additional revenue so that's good. That's money that we could put towards a lot of different things that we need right now, right? It could uh, defray the cuts that we have to our education system. It could help maybe partially fund this uh, Medicaid expansion, these types of things. But also it saves us money because guess what? If you make it harder for people to smoke, that's a lot less smoking incurred, you know, medical expenses, you know, people are living healthier lives. These are all things that we should be promoting. So it's really a win-win, right? So I think we need to be more broad in how we think about not just cutting our spending, but increasing our revenue. Because there are a lot of ways that actually would help us in, in multiple avenues. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? Those were all the questions from the chat. Um, oh, it looks like we have another one. Um, so at least in the pre-COVID times, the 2019 bu Georgia budget was a um, $2.9 billion year over year increase, but the Medicare expansion would only have cost $35 million a year. Why do you perceive that we can't do it? I think he meant Medicaid expansion. Yeah, yeah. I don't perceive that we can't do it because actually the proposal that Governor Kemp has put forth, which is his Medicaid waiver plan, um, it uh, puts forth a certain amount of money to sort of nominally expand some Medicaid coverage for many fewer people. Like I'm talking like less than a fifth as many people. 
and also to defray the cost for premiums for some people with private health insurance and stuff like that. The amount that the state would have to lay out for this plan, which he feels is better, actually is more money than we'd be spending for the Medicaid expansion because of the nine to one match that the federal government would be putting in. So I actually don't perceive that we can't do it. I perceive that we don't want to do it, right, which is a different thing. I think we don't want to do it because um, there's a lot of partisan ideology that prevents people from buying into the fact that the ACA could actually help people and is a good thing, right? Uh, but yeah, we, we could we could do it. We're spending more money than that on a far inferior product. So it doesn't doesn't make any sense. You're right. Um, I'll leave it open. Does anybody else have any questions? You can just unmute yourself and ask. Okay. Well, Dr. Out, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Congratulations on winning your race. And um, yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, guys. Hey, would you